all right, good morning. I'm gonna get started. My name is Molly Piccioni uh, and I am here to give a procedure day lecture. We are going to start with a case. I'm going to ask for a volunteer uh, in just a moment. So our case is a 75 year old male with a past medical history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, CVA with residual dysarthria, who was brought in by EMS from a nursing home for hypoxia. On arrival, the patient is awake, groaning, mumbling incomprehensibly and moving all extremities. His heart rate is 105, his BP is 140 over 90. He's breathing at 30 uh, per minute. His SpO2 is 75% on room air and it improves to 85% uh, with 10 liters on a venti mask. His airway has a small amount of vomitus in the mouth. He's uh, tachypnic and hypoxic. He's making gurgling noises and there's crackles in the right lower lung. His skin is well perfused. His mentation per EMS report is diminished. His finger stick is 106 and he's no other distracting injuries. Um, so for one of my junior residents, how do you set up to intubate this patient? Start basic, What's your, what equipment are you getting out as your senior is trying to organize the room? Bag. Yeah, so Jane said ambu bag, suction, this is gonna be IV on a monitor, you want your DL blade, your ET tube with a stylet and syringe. BVM, the end title uh, color detector, have your glide scope ready as a backup, have your pre-medications getting pulled, um, uh, have your stethoscope, you wanna make sure you're calling respiratory, it's a step that I think we sometimes forget. Um, you don't need your scalpel and cry kit at the ready, but you should know where they are in the airway cart. Um, similar, you should have the bougie kind of somewhere nearby, it doesn't necessarily need to be ready. Um, and even in the, the, the pre-COVID time, making sure you have a face shield on uh, to protect yourself. Um, so you pre-medicate this patient, you lay him back, and this is the airway. What are some things that you can do for this patient? Suction, yeah. Um, if you look through kind of some of the more basic textbook stuff, it just really talks about turning the patient to the side um, in addition to suction, but there's not a whole lot of other techniques that we have traditionally uh, you know, for this. Um, so, you know, one of the, te the technique that I'm gonna be talking about today is the suction assisted laryngoscopy and airway uh, decontamination or the salad technique. That seems to be really popular in full med right now, but uh, is mostly kind of videos and, uh, and, and readings without something that I think was so formally taught um, what you're actually gonna do with the suction when you have it ready to go. So our objectives today are to identify the indication and then describe the technique for salad. Um, again, we'll talk about the indications, the technique. Uh, we'll talk about the technique specifically for suction associ associated laryngoscopy and airway decontamination. We'll also mention briefly the suction associated, uh, ass assisted airway catheter insertion and the placement of an esophageal tracheal tube. Um, we'll talk about the limitations and then uh, discuss briefly some of the evidence for this procedure. So the indications are pretty simple. It's, it's ongoing something in the mouth that can be suctioned out. Um, so this is any sort of GI contents, blood, or secretions. Um, the kind of most important thing, if you're going to be doing this procedure, is to start by rethinking your use of the yank hour. It's not just going to be your suction, it's also going to be your tongue blade. Um, so everything you do with the yank hour is going to have to precede the, the blade. So you are you know, suctioning before you are putting a camera into any sort of, um, you know, any sort of secretions or contents. Uh, and you know, the, some of the videos and the, um, the, the blog posts that talk about this kind of suggest that if you really are trying to get well-trained with using the yank hour as a tongue blade, to practice using a tongue blade when you are intubating. So instead of just doing um, that sort of scissoring technique at, at the jaw, that you also kind of get into practice of putting a, a tongue blade in your right hand and, and using it um, to kind of move the tongue out of the way and, and get used to using two hands towards the mouth as opposed to maybe using one hand behind the back of the head or you know, whatever else you'd be doing with your, your right hand. Um, and again, always leading with the suction followed by laryngoscope. It has to be in that order or this is going to fail really quickly. Um, so the steps are, are pretty simple. It's just a question of getting into the habit of this. So again, uh, step one, suction first, followed by laryngoscope, always suction first. Two is that you wanna dock the suction catheter in the hypopharynx uh, or in the esophagus. You can see exactly where your, your contents are coming from. 
um, and move it towards the left side. You may need to switch your hands to manipulate this, uh, but you wanna kind of come across with the blade, I'm sorry, come across with the, um, the suction and get it into the left side of the mouth uh, and dock in the hypopharynx so that you can then again have your right hand free for actually putting your esophageal, I'm um, sorry, your endotracheal tube in after. The third step is to pin the suction in place with the laryngoscope blade. So again, the, the goal is to keep the suction in place for ongoing, uh, ongoing contents or secretions. Um, and you wanna try to pin it all on your left hand so that you have your right hand free and that uh, the, the suction isn't wobbling around in front of you. Then it's kind of back to back to the basics for intubation. You want to pass your ET tube, take out your guide wire, uh, you know, take out your your stylet, um, and inflate your cuff. This is another uh, step that is something we don't do thoughtfully every time, but you just want to remember that before you start to ventilate, you should suction out the ET tube. You should assume that whatever contents were in the mouth, some of them could be going down uh, into the trachea, and you don't want to you know uh, bag that right down into the lower respiratory tract. Um, and then we have a video of it. I don't know if this is Dr. DeCanso or Dr. Strayer, but it is a video posted by Dr. Strayer. We begin Strayer. today's demonstration with an explanation of what I call the static exercise. I will deliberately fill the mannequin's facts with simulated airway containment. I can, I can hear some mumbling that this is not our suction. I'll, I'll comment on that. This is not the same suction that we have. The initial exercise is to teach the clearing of airway contaminant with a suction as well, and to use the suction as a multifunction device, much like the use of a wooden tongue depressor to assist the insertion of the laryngoscope blade into the patient's mouth. What's important in the exercise is to lead with the suction, not lead with the laryngoscope. Otherwise, the laryngoscope's optics and video elements become occluded with airway contaminant. I'm going to begin the exercise. I'm now going to utilize the suction. I'm overhand gripping, overhand gripping like a dagger on the suction. I'm going to utilize it very much like a wooden tongue depressor to open the hypoparax to assist the insertion of the laryngoscope blade. I see airway contaminant in the posterior parts. I'm going to right behind that. I'm going to lead with the suction. Lead with the suction. I'm going to identify the laryngeal structures as the epiglottis. The tip of the laryngoscope is now in the molecular. I'm going to expose the larynx. And I'm going to suction airway contaminant from the uh, just below the larynx. The next maneuver is crucial to continue to be able to drain the Airway, right. airway management. I'm unable to place my tracheo tube into the airway with the suction in the position that it occupies right now. So I'll need to change the suction catheter position. I can do this either by pushing forward the laryngoscope and moving over the suction and then placing it into the uh, opening of these eyes, or alternatively, I can remove the suction and place it on the left side of the laryngoscope blade, we're placing the tip into the upper esophagus. The suction now literally holds itself, it's out of the way for tracheal tube delivery, and I'll complete the intubation by placing the tracheal tube into the larynx, removing the stylet, inflating the cuff, and then prior to ventilation, I'll suction the tracheal tube. We'll begin today's demonstration with an explanation of um, Okay. Uh, so during, while that, during that video was going on, I, I did hear uh, a little bit of, some, someone immediately kind of pointed out uh, that that is not the suction setup that we have. That is, uh, we use a yank hour, we only have yank hours. That is a decanto suction, and, suction, and it is an important distinction that is going to limit our procedure. Um, that is going to limit our procedure. I am going to also briefly just kind of discuss 
this, uh, or you know, uh, comment on this suction assisted airway catheter insertion um, with the caveat that this is something that we cannot do at all right now at County Ed or Downstate because we don't have the decanto suction, which you would need. Um, so this technique is, is, is very simply, if you get to the point you know, where you have, the, uh, the, you have your VL blade in place, you have your suction going and the, the secretions or contents are just too high output um, that you really can't manipulate and, and see, you know, the, you can't, you can't, there's just too much coming out. Um, you can directly intubate the airway with the suction, disconnect, put a bougie through and then take it out and seldinger your, your tube in over. Um, but again, this is not something that we can do. You need a large, you need a larger bore uh, suction, which is the decanter that we do not have at this time. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this is this. Um, the pictures that are up here, the one on the right is the the Yankauer. That's uh, the one that we have, and then on the left is the decanto. It's it's specifically it was made specifically for this procedure. It's big enough to pass a bougie through, kind of by design, so that you can you can just you know just tube with the uh, the suction itself. Um, an adjunct, uh, you know, that we can do. Um, is if there's too much content and you see ongoing output, um, is to just put the, the, the esophageal, I'm sorry, the endotracheal tube right in the esophagus. So if this is, you know, a GI bleed or there's vomitus or GI contents coming out, you, you intubate the esophagus intentionally, inflate the cuff and try to slow down whatever is coming out and then take a second uh, endotracheal tube and, uh, and properly intubate once you've you know, stopped uh, stop the contents. Um, some of the limitations of, of our procedure, uh, again, as, as we discussed, is that the Yankauer, uh, well, we haven't discussed yet, the Yankauer can't suction large particles. Um, it's very easy for the, the Yankauer to become occluded. Uh, and so this is something you have to be mindful of. Um, the other thing is that the VL blades can become dirty from contaminants very quickly. The, the picture on the side demonstrates the three different types of blades that we have. Um, we have our hyperangulated video laryngoscopy blade, um, which you would not be able to convert, convert to a DL view, um, as opposed to if we had like a standard geometry, geometry blade, which we, we did at one point. And I, I think actually we have for procedures today on the other side, if you're, when you get over there and get to practice this procedure. Um, but a, a standard geometry blade is gonna be more similar to a Mac or a Miller. But if your camera becomes occluded, you are a, or you know it becomes blocked, you are able to convert and, and DL. Um, yeah, so those are our limitations for this procedure. So we'll talk kind of briefly about the evidence for this procedure. There's not a ton of it, uh, and kind of all of the there's a lot of FOMED stuff that you can read about how to do this procedure um, and kind of how it came about. They they all kind of bring you back to three research papers that were done. Um, with pre-hospital providers, uh, and they are all geared around training providers. They're not patient-centered outcomes, but they are, you know, uh, metrics used for, you know, studies that were done based on trainings for pre-hospital providers. Um, so the first is a QI study that was done uh, that came out of a quality assurance review of intubations demonstrating um, that issues with suction was a key factor for requiring more than one attempt at intubation. So what they did is they trained paramedics and nurses in the pre-hospital setting. They had 25 participants um, who were informed when they on the day that they showed up for a quarterly training, they had no pre-notification that they were going to be doing this training. Uh, and they first started by having these providers intubate a mannequin that put out 650 cc's per minute of uh, simulated emesis. Then they received a training from an EMS trained physician, um, then reattempted the intubation. They collected data on the number of attempts uh, and the time to successful intubation. The mean time to successful intubation improved from 68 seconds to uh, 49.76 uh, seconds. Uh, and then there was a st statistically insignificant trend, but there was a trend in, the, in a decrease in the number of intubation attempts that are required were successful. Um, overall, it went from an average of 1.2 attempts to one attempt. 
Um, the second study uh, was similar. It was done with 41 EMT paramedics um, and utilized uh, three different you know, stages to the, uh, to the training. Um, they, they first did a control with like a clean simulated airway. The second was they did one practice round, or they did, uh, uh, they did this with the simulated emesis airway um, before any training, and then they did a, a third one that was post-training. Um, their training included a lecture, a demonstration, and then practice. Um, and each participant uh, completed each study arm three times so that they'd have a bigger pool of data. They looked at the time to successful intubation and the number of successful intubations out of the three attempts. Um, they showed also a non-significant, a non-statistically significant improvement in the time to successful intubation of a soiled airway. Um, that before their training, it took around 30 sec 37 seconds, uh, and after the training, it took around 26.9 seconds. Um, they also showed, they did show a statistically significant increase in the number of paramedics who were able to successfully intubate three out of three times. Um, it went from uh, around 36% of them were able to get all three intubations, and then after the training, um, around 80% of them were able to get all three intubations successfully. Uh, and then the third study um, was also a prospective study. It was done by the same folks that did the, the first one that we mentioned. Uh, and this was for pre-hospital providers again, and it used, utilized a large volume emesis mannequin. They took 40 participants. They did, uh, they used the emesis mannequin. They did one before they had a training. They did a second uh, arm after they had, or a, a second trial after they had the post-training. Uh, and then they did another one three months later. Um, they found that the median timed intubation for all subjects improved. Um, before the instruction, it took around 60 seconds uh, per provider. After instruction, it was 43 seconds. And then three months later, the retention was good, seemed to improve. Um, it, their intubation time was cut down to around 29 six seconds. Uh, in this study, there was no mention of any statistical significance. Um, yeah. So in summary, uh, one, use the yank hour blade as a tongue blade. Um, use the yank hour tongue blade. Two, you wanna always be leading with suction. Three, make sure you're suctioning out the ET tube before you're ventilating. And four, this is not an evidence-based practice at this time, um, but it is an adjunct for you to keep in mind. These are my resources. Do you have any questions? Thanks, Dr. Lucchese. Yeah. I mean, I think the suctioning In the past, what saved my butt a bunch of times is the sushi. In this case, it's the fact that you have that, you have that. So you want to uh, get as comfortable with using it, maybe even uh, sort of integrate to the simple solution that you can take with it. So you have a comfortable experience with it, and it's really not going to be a situation. I think it already says you can be infected. No, I know. The, uh, the comments were to get comfortable using the bougie even on the, the more simple intubations. And then a reminder, you should be suctioning you know, during your pre-oxygenation before you give your RSI meds. Try to clear the airway as much as possible before you lay the patient back. Yeah, you should come in thinking you're gonna have all this stuff in the mouth, right? This stuff, especially if you're trying to drink really quickly. Sometimes it's hard just to get that position bad enough to have your tube and everything in the ground right now. I mean, you have a really nice here. So this working and so a lot of Real estate in the world varies. If you can see everything, just put the movie down, and have everything get your way out, and then you have all the impact of that. And that, we forget that the bougie is actually designed for, for when you can't see the airway. That's literally what it's done. That's why it's kind of rigid, especially for that little bump in the end. So you can actually feel the tracheal uh, rings when you go through, and then you get that resistance. So it's really designed, and we're so used to using it just to help us you know, get in.
Yeah, Dr. Schechter is pointing out um, that the, the design of the bougie itself is meant to facilitate uh, if you can't see the cords, but it's got that kind of tipped, got anteriorly tipped uh, ends that you can feel the tracheal rings and the resistance. It's semi rigid. Yeah, the, the question was about other uh, other adjuncts for suctioning up larger particles, and the suggestions were to dis uh, disconnect the ank hour entirely, as well as consider using a large ET tube as a, the end of your suction tip. <laughs> 